And now, from the dark corners of the internet where the exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This interview is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, the creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at www.paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for cybersecurity. Wow, wow, I'm so sorry, SANS. I said cyber. Um, so anyway, what? and by the SANS <laughs> Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And... <clears throat> And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good, but for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host. A man who needs no introduction but needs a stiff drink, Paul Asadorian. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Paul's Security Weekly, episode 393 for Thursday, October 30th, 2014. Jack, I'm so glad you wore your Halloween costume. That's, that's right. I'm a As creepy old man. <laughs> <laughs> Almost don't need a costume for that, Jack. That's uh, <laughs> damn right. <laughs> Excited to be here tonight on the lines via Skype. We've got Mr. Joff Thayer. Joff, welcome. Hey, well, g'day, Paul and Jack. Yeah, I, I tell you, the kids are going to come to your door, Jack. Bing bong! And the mothers are going to go, run away, run, run away fast. Run. <laughs> Good evening, folks. Carlos <laughs> Perez. Snickers. I believe Carlos Perez is back with us. Yep. How's Happy to be here. Sorry for delay. Having a bit of a th thunderstorm over here. You know, that happens. It happens in sunny Puerto Rico when it's sometimes not so sunny. Um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> the Tenable PVS contest closes tomorrow. So if you're listening to this after October 31st, uh, you should have already submitted. In any case, check out the SteelCon competition. Enter to win a security tube training course. You must write documentation for an open source project. Details can be found at the link in the show notes, which is, of course, at wiki.securityweekly.com. Um, what else do I want to announce? The class went well. I <laughs> suck at life. Uh. And <laughs> a public apology to those who were coming to see me speak today. There was a massive scheduling fail. And Chris is now managing my schedule. <laughs> that is the change that came about of that. Is that Chris will be taking on administrative duties. Poor Chris. Yes. Wait, we not me. We talk not you, Chris. Not you, Chris. We'll introduce the you other next. Chris. Yes, you're a ghost up until this point. So sorry, we should have told you that before the show. Again, you brought me on the podcast to invite me to manage your schedule. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what you're going to do. Congratulations, Chris. That's a promotion. <laughs> yes, I apologize about that. That was uh, really bad, really bad. Oh, in other news, um, and I hope to be doing something locally to make up for that as well. I'm toying with free training. If we can make that happen, more than happy to do I was, that. I was bummed to not be there two weeks ago and heckle you, but I had to run down to D.C. and miss that one. At the That's right. Local That's user, right. local group. That meeting. one I actually made and showed up for. Yeah, I, I ended up having to drive down to D.C. to help set up for uh, mm. Besides D.C., which was a good gig. But, yeah, I missed that one. I missed that group because that was, the, that was uh, one of the first uh, technology groups that uh, – I connected with when I started having to do this nonsense for a living. And that's the IT Pro? Yeah, it's now the Rhode Island IT Pro. They've been around What's a while. They used to be a uh, What's Novell. What's their website? Is it they used IT? to be a Novell Netware group, to put it in perspective, how long they've been around. 
Uh, yeah, that's is, a little wild. I want to give a plug for their, their it-pro.org is their that's website. It's a local group here Rhode in Rhode Island. Island IT Pro Group. And they're uh, group mostly group, yeah. small business, but they've got a, a, a bunch of different perspectives on the world and just a good bunch of people that uh, Their meetings are pretty cool. I mean, they bring in informative, other than yeah. me, they bring in informative speakers yep. Yep. and uh, they give away free books in every meeting and... It's good. just a nice bunch of people. Yeah, it's, good. it's a good bunch of like. people, and they're uh, happy to, to help folks. And, uh, like and they're looking for more members. They want to increase attendance. Like which I, I wanted to mention um, them on the show. Yeah, I, like I said, they were uh, one of the first groups that I got involved in when I ended mm-hmm. up having to like really make stuff work, and they were extremely helpful. And uh, that's kind of how I got into all this community stuff. It's like, wow, these people have been really helpful. I found something kind of cool. Do you want to know what I found? It's like, yeah, let's share what we know. And yeah. uh, that sort of set the tone for what I've done for the past, uh, well, longer than I care to admit. Um, well, I'm happy to admit that the uh, sharing information thing is uh, continues to be a trend. Yeah, and uh, so there's some a lot of job openings. If you're here in Rhode Island, actually, we're looking for some people to do some stuff. So if you want to be involved with Security Weekly, send me an email, paul at securityweekly.com, and uh, let's talk. There's a lot of open positions. Why did I get that? No, it's dot com. We're still confused about the email cutover, which is after the show, I'll be giving a presentation on how our email conversion went. So for those that are interested in converting email accounts on Google Apps for Business. We're going we're gonna to whiteboard that. We're going to whiteboard that for <laughs> everyone. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so yeah, paul at securityweekly.com. Please send me email. There's all kinds of positions that we have open. Not like that, Jack. <laughs> I'm I'm just picturing the Security <laughs> Weekly Kama Sutra. Speaking uh. of open positions, <laughs> there are some open positions at Tenable Network Security. You can go to tenable.com forward slash careers. Specifically, there is a product marketing manager for Nessus position and a senior product marketing manager for Nessus position. Two open positions there as well. So Nessus Ninja, who can not only communicate with your network, but with the network of people. Right. Um, is uh, that's it? Yeah, that'd be interesting. Because um, and there's other open positions as well, but those are the two that are. There are a couple of other. I wanted to highlight are, um, this week. They're quote, yeah, we're growing, we're growing like mad. Absolutely. And uh, we're uh, it's a great we're place to work. Fun. I've been there five and a half years. Damn, you're old. I am old now. <laughs> I am officially old. I, I yeah, I've been there not quite three and a half now. Yeah, but it's Good. changed a little bit. How many people were there when you joined? 95. Where are we so now? 414? 400 420? plus. 420? Yeah. Something like that. So anyway. Lots of exciting opportunities there. <sighs> um, and Paul and I work remote, so you don't have to see us every day in a cubicle. That's just right. In case and you were terrified by that prospect. There we are do work remote. You can work remote. Sometimes <laughs> uh, the jobs don't always say that, so don't let that put you off. Yeah, so. I mean, some jobs need to be in the office, obviously. Right. But uh, the office is Columbia, so Columbia, Maryland. If that's the only thing that's holding you back... By all means, contact myself or Jack and yeah, apply. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you uh, know what? I'd double down on that for anybody who's interested in the, in this particular industry, actually. Um, you can work from pretty much anywhere. You yep. get the right people. Very um, true. Let's see. I, I haven't been home in a month. Yes, Chris Crowley's with us, who hasn't been home in a month. He has 15 years of industry experience managing and securing networks, currently an independent consultant. In the Washington, D.C. area, his work experience includes penetration testing, computer network defense, incident response, and forensics analysis. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Chris is also a fabulous sand, certified SANS instructor. We just missed each other out in Las Vegas. That's um, right. Yeah, so Chris, I was teaching us. 575. You were, uh, you were teaching your, your class on uh, embedded devices. That's right. Uh, Chris, tell us how you got your start in information security. Um, so I was actually working at um, Tulane University years ago and uh, doing operations. Basically, all these students kept hacking stuff, so <laughs> I had to figure out how, how to deal with it. Um, at the same time, it was um, basically spam coming in. This was sort of at, like the uh, the dawn of the spam era, so set up uh, anti-spam filters, set up things to deal with uh, the stuff that nobody wanted, and then within about a few years, it was ninety-five uh, percent of the mail that was coming in that we were dropping. Basically, had to do incident response and all sorts of different things. Um, you know, 
FBI showed up one day and was like, hey, you guys got a uh, whole bunch of computers over there in one department. We need to grab them. So helped with that. That's pretty much how I got started. <clears throat> Very cool. Um, so tell us about some of the SANS classes uh, that you're teaching, Chris. Well, so I actually teach mostly in the pen test curriculum. I teach 504 incident response uh, and uh, incident handling and hacker techniques. I teach everyone, the 560 everyone pen take testing that class. class. Everyone should take that class at least twice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Or, or you take it and then five years later you take it again just to right. uh, brush up to on brush things because stuff agree. changes. The class that I teach most of the time is the uh, 575 mobile device pen testing. I occasionally um, am teaching now the um, 585 mobile de- mobile forensics class, mm-hmm. and then I also teach a, um, a one day that I'm the course author for, and it's uh, actually managing the incident response team. I'm splitting that to a two day, so nice. as of uh, hopefully um, Orlando 2015, that will that class will expand to a two day class and add a lot more interactive and exercise stuff. Right now, it's just me prattling on for six hours, which. No surprise, people uh, people don't seem to like. They want to have a little respite from that. So, right, that's what I do for Sans. Cool. So, um, how did you get started in mobile device security? You know, it was interesting. Uh, you know, several years back, I was doing a bunch of stuff in Blackberries, just where I was working at the time, which is a big federal government agency. Uh, we had a lot of Blackberries, a lot of uh, Blackberry issues, and so we started working on that. And then that was uh, around the time where. Basically, the executive team started getting interested in iPads. So it was really the uh, the original BlackBerry um, platform, and then um, iPads that drove me into mobile. And it was really challenging when I uh, started working on iPads because I didn't have direct drive access to anything. So I was using uh, you know, different tools in order to be able to figure out what was actually on the devices, and wasn't particularly easy. Then um, after a little while, I was talking with uh, Josh Wright at Sands, and he said that they had a, uh, a class that he was authoring, and they were looking for somebody to actually specialize in, uh, in teaching that. So because of because of that iOS experience that I had and the uh, the BlackBerry platform stuff that I had done previously, started moving into that, and it's just just been that way since. I mean, it's obviously uh, you know a, an area where there's a tremendous amount of development right now, and you know nobody's without a smartphone. And I think that most people in the world eventually are not going to have computers. They're just going to have a smartphone. They're going to have a tablet, and that's about all they got It seems like as far as compute devices. It seems like right now that mobile falls into an interesting category for a lot of organizations where they've got so many other problems that tackling the mobile issue is kind of further down on the list. How, how do you address that kind of mindset as obviously you teach the class you must feel strongly that it should be higher up on people's list but i kind of feel like it's not yeah um what i find is happening to a lot of people uh, the it professionals or who i see in my class have uh, been tasked with coming into the class to figure out what they need to do because their organization has basically already purchased an mdm solution or an emm solution or a byod solution or whatever the hell you want to call it a lot of buzzwords in there chris yeah, exactly. Sorry. I don't, I don't <laughs> no, even know no, what they cool. mean, but basically, you know, they've purchased some solution to actually address the mobile devices. And then they don't know what this stuff can do. And then they send somebody from IT. They're like, okay, um, you seem like you're super busy and tend to get things done. So now you need to go and like figure out what we're going to do with mobile devices. Because as of right now, everybody's happy that they can use their phone, but we're kind of concerned that maybe there's a whole bunch of mobile uh, data on these mobile devices that we don't know about. So that's pretty much what, what I'm saying is that you have to um, fix it after the fact, which is sort of the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, most organizations have already deployed, and then you're not, now trying to go back and resolve the issue. So but how so you, you actually prioritize it, yeah. I find I, I find that the best way to do it, um, just as a, a quick win, is to try to get a couple people in the executive um, team to allow you to take a look at the uh, content of a few mobile devices, even if you give them a demo one and say, hey, just take this mobile device, right? Don't use it as your primary personal stuff because I'm really not interested in seeing all, any of that, right? But just take this mobile device and use it at the coffee shop and look at some stuff and do a few things and take it for about two weeks and just check it out. Then give it back to me after two weeks and let me show you what I found about what you did. 
and then they start to realize all the content that's on these devices. So uh, you know, it's, really it's not always that you can get yeah. that individual to, to be so participatory in the uh, demonstration component, but maybe sometimes you have to you have to prove the point before they'll allow you to actually um, get in there and do more configuration. Another thing that I find is um, really important is to talk about the mobile applications that a lot of people are installing on devices, um, and then actually show the flaws that are present and the amount of data that's being leaked out of these devices. Demonstrate that, and then all of a sudden you get the opportunity to um, present a um, application assessment program or get involved in some sort of at least double checks um, and say, okay, there's no like red flag behavior on these applications before we start installing them on the people who work on the phones for the people who work for us. Now, so you um, can you know, go all get, those contacts, um, all the location information, all the emails are potentially at risk. So. so you can go get an MDM and then you're fine, right? Is that I see a lot of people who have just purchased an MDM with the mindset of, oh, well, we just need to figure out how to tweak this thing and then we'll be all set. And they don't have the appropriate policy and not mm -hmm. like I'm a huge fan of, you know, developing policy, but it's actually the bedrock for all the things that we end up doing. And they don't have the, uh, the technical understanding of um, what data is present and what risks are actually associated with these devices. So it's just a big educational process because these are, these are just compute devices that are basically unsecure that have access back into the corporate information stores. So, Chris, what, what tools exist for organizations to identify malware on mobile devices and also applications that want to do evil things or malicious things on mobile devices? So it's interesting, depending upon the platform, um, so, so iOS, for the most part, um, you're not going to have malware per se. Um, mm -hmm. with, the, with the application code signing scenario, um, if, if, you, if Apple has not authorized a particular application, there's, it's not going to run. So Mac, some, Macs don't get viruses. I mean, that's if, you have a, uh, if you have a jailbroken iOS device... Um, then all bets are off with that regard because jailbreaks essentially mm -hmm. disable the code signing capability of the, uh, of the iOS platform. So um, really the best thing for organizations to do when they're dealing with iOS devices is if there is a jailbreak that's discovered on that platform, essentially to pull all the corporate information back off of that. Yeah, off all of that bets device. are off. Yep. You know, so that's, that's, a, that's unfortunately kind of an arms race in terms of the mm -hmm. jailbreak detection scenario because... Jailbreak detection fundamentally depends on the um, operating system to provide information to whatever application it is that you're running in order to do the jailbreak detection. So kind of a cat and mouse game there between the people who are developing things like XCON to mask um, jailbreaks and the people who are um, trying to discover that the device is actually jailbroken. Now, go ahead. Did you yeah, I was just going to say, so if you have a jailbroken device, can you like remove the management software that you would or apps that you would put on there that ties it back to the MDM? Certainly. If you have a jailbroken device, you could you could disable that um, software. You also could do things where you could allow the software to run, mm -hmm. but then um, manipulate the software while it's running. You know, so City of Substrate and some of the other tweaks that are available through the um, you know, um, um, City of App Store will actually change the behavior of the management software to simultaneously allow you to have access to the to whatever resources that MDM facilitates or the BYOD container facilitates, but then um, disable the component of that software in order to make it so that it doesn't realize that the uh, device is jailbroken. So, so does that also mean I can manipulate apps like Pandora to let me skip as many songs as I want? <laughs> that's that's one example, you know, Snapchat to make it so that you can... Uh, you know, Snapchat to make it so that I can download all the, uh, yeah. the pictures that are coming through, even though I'm not supposed to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. No notification being sent back. Um, you know, the the opportunity for tweaks is uh, is is pretty substantial. And it said, um, essentially, when you've jailbroken that device, you can manipulate the uh, the running process memory. So. Gotcha. That's awesome. So now, what about Android? So Android is uh, is another story. There, um, actually, the Google Play Store. The software itself will do um, malware detection. There mm -hmm. are a, a number of applications that are set up in order to detect malware. It's actually the statistics um, say that a, at least 95% of the known malware for mobile platforms is targeted at Android devices. 
Um, and, and a lot of that is due to the fact that the, um, the APKs that get delivered for Android devices, while by default, Android is configured not to allow uh, stuff coming from third parties. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy for the user to just decide that they want to download an APK from anywhere and install it. And so even, um, you know, the Google Play application, as it's going to install this APK, may warn the user and say, look, this is, this is not a good thing uh, to install. Actually, I, I love it. Every time I restart one of, my, uh, one of my rooted Android devices, it says, hey, this towel root application, you really should remove this because we think it's bad, right? So it warns me every time and it says this application's um, not desirable. We know that it's potentially, um, potentially problematic, but I can still just override that behavior. Okay. So um, Android, we have antivirus to, to detect that, but um, most of the antivirus applications are not running truly at the, um, at the platform or operating system level. They're running more within an application space. So it's a difficult thing for them to really protect the mobile devices um, for Android platform because the antivirus doesn't necessarily have the same sort of um, low-level control um, that you would need in order to really uh, protect it. And so what's happening is a lot of the, the uh, platforms are moving to using SE Android. Um, so Knox, um, as an example, Samsung Knox is essentially leveraging um, the SE Android capabilities in order to provide more control to the, uh, to the platform. So that's an example of something that is going down the path of giving uh, control to a, um, a management provider who can then say, okay, this is what's authorized and this is what is not authorized. Right. What, um, about, what about Windows? Win Windows, ahead, yeah, sorry. do people use Windows? People don't use Windows Phone, do they? I have a Windows Phone. I know, oh. I know at least one person who uses a Windows Phone. It's me. I actually own one Windows Phone. Is that what you use as your phone? No. Oh. <laughs> you got me excited. I, while, isn't it like so. the most secure platform because no one really uses it? I, I agree with that. I mean, in terms of what we know about, in terms of uh, in terms of security, um, unrestrictive software, so jailbreak, uh, malware, root, whatever you know, any of those things, we just don't uh, we just don't have it for Windows Phone, um, which I say is a bit of being damned by faint praise mm -hmm. because basically no one's developing a malware for Windows Phone. I think next year, I think 2015, um, we'll start to see some more of that, but we haven't seen it yet. Mm. Interesting. Um, so uh, let's take a step back for a moment. What can we do as users to help protect ourselves on our various, let's say, iOS and Android, right? Yeah. So, what can we yeah, do? so if we kind of constrain it to that iOS, unless you're, um, unless you're using the device in order to do um, assessment of applications, um, basically don't jailbreak your device. Um, the major and primary protection that iOS provides is the um, Apple code signing, um, and that basically protects users from having malware run on their uh, devices. So iOS, if you're if you're going down that path, Apple is taking care of a substantial amount of the security for you. Now you have to give up some control if you actually go down that path because there are things that Apple doesn't want you to do and that's just the end of it. Mm -hmm. So if you are, are doing it for iOS, the, the primary thing that as a user you can do is not jailbreak your phone. Gotcha. Um, for Android, the primary thing that you can do is to make it so that you do not install APKs from anywhere outside of the Google Play Store. Um, that's a simple precaution that will save you a tremendous amount of headache. And if you are thinking about installing something from outside of that Play Store, what I would do is actually do an assessment of the application before you install it on your device. We've seen a couple of vulnerabilities in, um, in older APIs of, uh, of Android applications. So API 16 and prior, we actually have a, uh, a flaw that we know about as the, uh, the web view add JavaScript interface flaw. Um, so even if you installed those legitimate apps, um, once that was actually uh, discovered, you still have an opportunity for information loss and um, remote command and control of your device if someone um, leverages that particular flaw. At the time that that came out, I think it was around June of 2013, 50% um, of the top 1,000 apps in, uh, in the um, Google Play Store were actually potentially vulnerable to this particular flaw. So. Um, in that case, it's uh, update. 
<laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, with Android, updates are, uh, are not always available to users for the platforms that they're dealing in. So, so if you're going to purchase a phone and say you want to run Android, uh, or even any phone, really, I mean, do you go get the Google Nexus phone where you're, you can update the operating system directly, or do you roll the dice and get one from a provider? So um, I think that if you're looking to minimize your exposure, you go ahead and go with the, uh, the Nexus line because that gives you the best opportunity to be on the most up-to-date operating system. And Open Handset Alliance is providing updates very quickly for, uh, you know, for the, the Nexus phones. The problem is the majority of the other phones provided by um, providers don't get updates very often. But now, do so, you get do you get support for the phone? You get support from the phone from the provider. So, like, what if you have a problem with your phone? You can't call Google, right? There's no. Uh, yeah. So, so if you have a problem with the uh, with the Nexus phone, um, I think that that actually goes back through Google. So, if mm. you buy it directly from them, yeah. If you buy an unrestricted Nexus phone, then right. I think that any sort of phone support goes back from them. If you buy a Nexus, you know, whatever phone from. Um, a provider. You know, any of the big providers, then you go back to the provider for that. Now, if you buy a Nexus from a provider, can you up, apply the updates, or do you have to get the provider's updates? So it actually uh, it actually depends um, on the provider. Hmm. I I have all the Nexus devices that I've purchased. I've purchased directly. Yeah. Um, for the for the sole reason of not having anybody interfering with that stream of updates with me. Mm -hmm. Problem is, for a lot of people, the the cost of the cost difference there is several hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Right, so you buy an underwritten phone from your provider, and it's you know two hundred bucks. You go and look at the same phone straight from uh, straight from the Nexus or you know um, Android Experience, and it's five hundred or six hundred dollars. So people are looking at that, saying, "Wait a minute, same phone. Um, I just have to sign a two-year contract over here, um, or I could buy the the phone from Google and then not have a contract." But still pay the same amount. Why wouldn't I just go ahead and um, you know get it directly from the provider? So it, this is one of my big um, yeah. complaints uh, with Android. By the way, I'm an Android user, right? I mean, I, I actually like Android. That's what I use as um, as you probably know. I, I have a lot of phones, but as my as my primary personal phone, I use Android because I actually want to support it. I think it's a good thing. I like the open source effort, but at the same time, it has a limitation. And so my Nexus Five that I have that I use as a, as a work phone, I always have it up to date. As soon as stuff comes out, it gets its updates. My other primary phone, it lags. So, I mean, I'm on like, I'm still on, uh, you know, Android 4.3 on that particular device, which is a pain, right? And there's no reason for it, except for right. um, contention among the participants in the Open Handset Alliance, which well, to me is the biggest point of frustration um, with Android. Have you noticed on the uh, Google uh, products you buy directly, though, that they uh, sort of stop pushing out updates a month or two before uh, the next model is released. Uh, yeah. Or, so, so most of the time they're better until it's time to buy a new machine. Yeah, although although I while I have seen that, I still get the, um, I have a Nexus 4, I have an old generation Nexus 7 tablet, I have a newer generation Nexus 7 tablet. Um, I get the update on all of them. So while well, yeah, it so, may, is it, so um, if you lag if, a little bit, so um, it if, actually still right. comes back around and gets the update. Yeah. So if you bought the most expensive Android that your carrier offered three years ago, uh, it's a safe bet that if you're re relying on the carrier, you're uh, let's just say you're not running four four or anything. You're not. You're not running <laughs> the latest one, which is which is really unfortunate, and it's going to cause a lot of problems for the long term. Because honestly, um, you know, if you think about it worldwide. People are not refreshing their phones every uh, 12 months, which is, you know, on average what you get for support for a carrier underwritten phone um, in terms of updates. Sometimes you don't even get that. Um, but most people's refresh cycles are every two years. But worldwide, we're looking at a tremendous number of vulnerable phones. Um, and if, if someone were to be truly malicious and try to do something that was incredibly damaging to everybody, to the worldwide networks, if I were going to target a platform and do that, it would be Android, right? Because you got all these phones that are still running two, three. I'm, so not, that, ta I'm not talking about exclusively in the U.S. I'm talking about worldwide. Yeah. There are a tremendous number of vulnerable phones still out there. So, I mean, that's kind of a, almost a, 
an endorsement to get an iPhone. Yeah, you know, except then you go to the baseband issues and the man- carrier level management tools that are completely insecure um, and bypass all of this at a deeper <laughs> level. So, so it's an endorsement in um, in a way for iPhones if you want to transfer the responsibility for your security over to a third party and not really participate in it very much. If you don't want to actually watch it, if you don't want to have to look at the apps, if you don't want to do those things, then a lot of that is taken care of on the iPhone platform. Okay. And you know, if someone were to ask me just generically, um, I have this generic company, we want a new mobile platform, what would you suggest? Unless I hear like a lot of other details, I mean the de facto standard for a lot of companies would be an iPhone platform okay. because there's so much restriction on it. You know, and, so, and, so, and Chris, Apple I'm, only has like basically five or six devices that they have to worry about securing. Yeah. Right. Now, it, my it also uh, just uh, my, yeah, my yeah. thought there for for a lot of the folks listening, uh, those of us who like to play with stuff. There's the phone that we want, and then there's the phone for friends and family and coworkers. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's you know it's like uh, it's like when you tell your siblings to get a Mac because you don't want to support. You don't want to support them on anything but a Mac, right? right. So, so just just get an iPhone, really. Just get. But yeah, I, I saw you. You got that Samsung Note thing, and it's big, and it does all. Yeah, it do, yes, it does. Get it. Get an iPhone. You want a big yeah. one? Get a six plus. Just, just to, yeah, right. <laughs> it's a, it's an easy choice. And so the other side of that is that that's very generic advice. But if someone were to tell me more details and give me more information, you know, I may I may lead more towards Windows Phone for uh, for an organization that has. You know that sort of deployment, um, and they have very specific needs. Um, I think that Windows Phone is actually um, a decent platform for security purposes. Um, the big, the big downside for Windows Phone currently is the user acceptance. People really like iPhones. They really like the user experience of the iPhones and those tablets. People right now don't really like the the Windows Phone. Um, even though there's comparable security controls in place for Windows Phone and for um, and for iOS, there is uh, an avenue of additional code base that you have to deal with um, on Windows Phone because what you've got is you've got third parties, uh, both manufacturers and mobile providers, who have the opportunity to insert additional code into the Windows Phone, um, where you don't have as much of an opportunity for that on iOS. Um, and but then, as you say, and, and rightly so, Jack, is that with Android, Android is, is liberty, right? Android has, gives you ultimate latitude. So for those of us who want to change things, who want to dig in, who want to have a tremendous amount of control and insight into what's going on, Android phone is a really good choice for them. So. Yeah, Chris, I'm torn. I, I have a Note 3, and I want to maintain my big screen. And I don't know if I want to go with the new Nexus or an iPhone 6 Plus or the Note 4. What are your thoughts there? This is completely self-serving, by the way. <laughs> oh, jeez, I think Paul. that. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I, I, that I said for, it was self-serving, you, and I'm and I'm not positive um, exactly what you like. But in terms of the in terms of the big screen, I'd go with the iPhone. I think that I think that it's it's slick. What I've seen of it, it's really nice. The the feel is good. And, and you can you fold it and like put it in it, your pocket, which is awesome. Of, yeah. <laughs> Wait, say that again. You know, I said you can, I, I you can got, fold it and put it in your I, I pocket. I can't help but point out the irony that, that I've been sitting back here and thinking about, and that is the malware targeting of Microsoft in the desktop era had been going on for years because they, they had the market share. They were they cornered the market, and, and the compl- the model is completely flipped on its end now. You know, Windows is Windows Mobile is catching up, and, and, and the malware uh, marketplace has moved over to the uh, largely the Android space. So it's, it's really an interesting interesting world which we live in you know crime is crime of opportunity yeah, i guess is the the stating the obvious job. Well, well job you, you got to understand that um, windows mobile is catching up i don't think that's true yeah. well, well I mean, that's probably a little bit optimistic but yeah <laughs> Jeff, you got to understand that you know windows owning the desktop market is like sony owning the vhs market right now and that's the the kind of the parallel between the two well yes i thanks paul i understand that but <laughs> captain obvious <laughs> and one question how do you feel about google kind of not being so open when it comes to vulnerabilities. Many times researchers will go to them, hey, we have this vulnerability, would you guys patch it? Um, they patch it, there's no advisory, 
There's nothing in the release notes that say, hey, this melody was patched, it was addressed. Uh, many times, uh, unless it has been public, then they kind of probably add it to a release note if if they're not forced to. They kind of are, even though it is open source, it's, they're not quite so open when it comes to when they address vulnerabilities in the OS itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan of that. It's it's kind of like this. If I'm dealing with an open platform, I want openness, right? I mean, that's that's why I like it, and that's what I want to support. And I don't want someone doing a bunch of uh, you know backroom stuff on my open platform. So, so the, yes, that's frustrating. Um, it's definitely frustrating. But I I don't know how to change that. Honestly, um, there are a couple of things I'd like to change about Android. Um, that's one of them. A lot more, um, you know, like community direct um, engagement. Another thing that I'm sick of on Android, and there's no reason for it to still be there, is the fact that users cannot granularly control the permissions that they grant to applications. That drives me nuts. There's no reason on an a open source, truly open platform that we can't have a, a, a toggle of like this particular app, I don't want it to turn my microphone on. Have you looked right now? At, it's an all or nothing choice on, yeah, uh, it on asks you application when it, permissions. It asks you when it installs it, right? It says if you install this What's app, it's, it, it asks you on upon installation. If you install this app, it's going to have access to all that stuff, and then that's the last you can do about it. It's either that's install your choice. it or don't. That's your choice. Install right. it or don't, mm -hmm. right? And and that platform doesn't need to be like that, right? And in fact, in um, Android 4.2, there were a bunch of hidden options for applications permissions that were actually uh, going the direction of allowing the per permi um, permission per application toggles. And um, they went away from it. And that's really unfortunate. That's a big beef that I have with Android. Because mm. for an open platform, that's what we should have. For someone who really advocates you know, privacy and security and uh, control by the individual of their own data, that should be present. And it's just not. Right. I wonder if it is since they are actually an art advertising company they're going like well if we provide this then they can block the information we can gather from them from which we make money from i i agree i think that that has something to do with it and i think that the um the other part of it is the folks um within the the environment it's not just the open hands head alliance but they have a bunch of vendors who are also who are also in there um making decisions and so i think that's a huge factor and influence on it has anybody taken a look at uh, McAfee's devasive, John McAfee, not Intel security, um, McAfee's uh, privacy tool for Android? I have uh, I threw it on a phone, have not played with it a lot, other than if you tell it to block stuff or alert you to stuff, it tells you a lot of things, but I haven't taken a close look at it. Sorry, I kind of missed that, um, Jack. I apologize. I'm having sort of uh, a tough time hearing. Uh, John McAfee... Um, say what you will, uh, but John McAfee has released his uh, privacy tool for Android. It's called something like Devasive, and I've uh, I've installed it. I really haven't dug into it too much, but it uh, you know it's, it sets off alarms every time the microphone or the camera or you know wireless or Bluetooth kick on or a variety of other things. And there's some granular controls I haven't uh, really played with yet. But I was wondering if anybody has taken a look at that. It seems to be. Um, even if it works perfectly, it's bolting on something that, that should be built in, I think. But it may be a stopgap until we can get uh, Android where it should be. But uh, that's, yeah, not, that's that, not an I endorsement, that, um, by the way. It's I don't you know, know that's yet. That's good for the, for the um, more security-aware users. Right. Not, yeah, but I don't think that it's not a solution for your little for sister the, or big brother or whatever. People. Right. Yep. But isn't that the evolution that these things tend to follow anyway? I mean, if you think back again into the PC market in the early days, the, the security defense products were, were for initially targeted at the more security aware users and then filtered out into the general marketplace. So I think there's a, there's a precedent there that, that uh, is, is potentially being followed in the mobile marketplace too. Very cool. Uh, any uh, further questions? For, oh, Chris, uh, our, uh, our Chris has a question for you, Chris. The OnePlus. What are your thoughts on the OnePlus? The which one? It's called One, one Plus One. One Plus One. 
oneplus.net. It's a 2014 flagship killer, is what it says. It's a phone, apparently. Our Chris, do you want to give us some background on that? Sure. So it's it's the flagship killer phone. Um, Sorry, I'm not really hearing anything anymore. It's it like all static. It runs Android and Cyogen mod. Um, yeah, I, I think it's referring to the OnePlus One, the Android phone that actually is coming out of Taiwan uh, from one of the companies over there. That is actually kind of like the Cyanogen mod official phone where they integrated some of the tech secure stuff into it. But at the same time, uh, if you look at the full disclosure mail list, there have been a, a bit of criticism about it. Yeah, so I, I actually haven't um, had a chance to assess that. There are actually several phones that seem like they're coming out now that are along those lines where it's like the um, the black phone from the Silent Circle folks. Yeah. There's this one, the OnePlus One. There, an, an, um, Samsung Knox is like a, more of a, a commercial version. There's the um, black phone from Boeing. There are a lot of security-focused Android um, telephones coming out. And I think that this is good, but I think it's going to take us a couple of years to really get through a lot of these flaws so that these phones that are security restricted Android platform phones actually don't have stupid, stupid flaws. I mean, it, you, the one that just came out, um, a, a, a flaw announcement related to Knox, where there's basically <laughs> a, a recovery pin that allows you to um, recover the, um, the passcode that you use to encrypt the device. And that's actually stored in plain text on the, on the phone. So I think that while the there are a lot of people that are going in that direction to do to do the right thing, um, they're going to have growing pains, and it's not going to be good for the for the next six months to a year. Cool, <clears throat> Chris, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh, I didn't. I didn't know I signed up for that. <laughs> Every, everyone does. It's in your agreement. I guess Lisa that's Lyon. a yes. Yes. Yeah, Three words to describe yourself. Um, red, um, perspicacious, and uh, hmm, adventurous. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Poison. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? <clears throat> Adventures in Candyland. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Mm, first. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. Marilyn Chambers. And um, Beyond Borg. Very cool. Chris, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. I'm sure our paths will cross soon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you in the next one. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Thank you. See ya. Thanks, Chris. Good to meet you. Ciao. And with that, we're going to take a short break. Come back with the stories for this week. <laughs> 